Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone that's here at GMA and everyone who's on the screen this morning in your homes, wherever you are. Hope you're warm and comfortable. Um, my name is Susan Barry. I'm the CEO of GMA. And um, I left my notes on my desk, but you know, we've been doing this a few times, so I think I know the drill, but this has really been a fantastic experience for me as a newcomer to GMA and for our entire team. And I hope it's been a fantastic experience for you as well. Today, we get to get down to the nitty gritty and hear from organizations. Um, Heidi and the team have just done a fantastic job with that. And we, could, we wouldn't be here today without your support. So we're gonna continue to link <laughs> arms and learn and I'll turn it over to Judy. I mean, to who? <laughs> <laughs> I know not me, but thank you. <laughs> okay, so thank you again for everyone for, for being here. Um, Susan, you missed it, but uh, so the other Susan is in Hawaii. So she's here really early. We appreciate Hi, that. Hi, Susan. Although you can't Hawaii. feel too bad because she's in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, I love it. Well, thank you for coming on so early. Yes. Um, so we will be in a uh, little, little more than a minute letting in the first, the first group, which is duet. Uh, Mike Larson will be joining. I, you all, I hope, received the email that had the agenda for today. It also had attached the letter that we sent to each of the organizations in which uh, we gave them a list of issues that we wanted covered that, were, that came from your suggestions at the previous meeting. And um, it also offered the opportunity for them to set up a meeting if they wanted to talk more about what they were doing. And they all took, took us up on the offer. So we know each one of them kind of went through the questions with them. Someone's trying to get in. Um, That's going to be the... Um, Duet people. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> don't let them in yet. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, okay. So we have each each group will have ten minutes. They're going to have seven minutes to present, three minutes for Q and A. If if you can avoid interrupting their seven minutes, give them their seven minutes, and then we can ask them questions. Um, we have five minutes between one organization to the next. That's intentional, so that if one run, if we do run over a minute or two, we still can stay on time. The time in between, we can have quick conversation, but mostly we will just be. Um, you know, talking about it and then making sure that we're on time for the next group. Quick mm -hmm. stretch in between. If yes. You need it. Any questions? Are we ready to rock and roll? Ready? I would All just right. like to make an observation if I can quickly. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Thank you to you guys. You've done an awesome job preparing us for each of our four sessions and in particular pulling all of this to together today so that we're informed and ready and welcoming and eager to make decisions. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Thank I appreciate it. Yeah. All right, we're off to duet. Should pop up. I think you make it mm -hmm. big. Yeah. <clears throat> you spotlight. Mm -hmm. okay. I have no idea what you're about. Mm -hmm. Hello, Mike. Mike. Thank you for Thank joining you. us. We're thrilled to have you here, and the floor is yours. We're not going to take time to introduce because we want you to have all of your minutes. So, great, uh, <laughs> nice to see you all. Uh, thanks for the opportunity um, to share this. You know, as I share with Heidi, this is something we follow along with, uh, sort of the, the guaranteed income work, and are excited about the opportunity. Can everybody hear me? Okay, not great. Okay. Not great. Speak up a little bit. That'd be speak great. up a little bit. It's not great. <laughs> I may I may do the awkward put my face too close to the screen. Is it can <laughs> I, yes? Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm just gonna spend a few minutes running through uh, some of the questions from ahead of time and then leave some time at the end. So um, as you all know, we're duet, we're a nonprofit here, we're a college coaching organization. Um, we partner directly uh, with Southern New Hampshire University. They provide the online college, and what we do is we provide start to finish coaching to make student make sure students enroll in the program and are able to complete as fast as possible. Our target audience are students who need a college degree to get ahead, but just can't access the traditional system. Um, so students that may have to work, um, can't afford it, uh, have family responsibilities. Uh, sort of our theory is the traditional system is very rigid and structured and expensive. Um, and it keeps out a lot of folks who are smart and hardworking and have exactly what it takes, but just can't make the design work for them. Um, since we launched initially the small pilot program, we've helped more than 500 students graduate with associates and bachelor's degrees from Southern New Hampshire University. <clears throat> Most of our students are from greater Boston, 
uh, Eastern Massachusetts. Um, most have tried college in the past, but didn't graduate or never went in the first place. 85% uh, of our students are Black or Latino. 33% are parents. Um, they, we work with students with a diverse set of professional backgrounds. Uh, some students that have been working in hospitals or school systems. Other folks, particularly younger students, who've largely been working retail, um, so of our programs like that. 80% um, of our students receive the Pell Grant, which is based on income, or would if they were eligible for it. Um, some are not for citizenship uh, requirements and that sort of thing. Um, and we work with about 850 students a year, uh, and approximately 30% of those are between the ages of 18 and 24, which I know is, is the target group um, for this piece uh, of, of work. Um, and so that's a little bit about Duet. In, in terms of how it could look at Duet, uh, we've done some, some thinking about this. So we have a um, director of student supports already on the team. Her name's Sarah, she's awesome. Um, she's a, she's a uh, licensed social worker, also leads a lot of our um, sort of community work. It's really, you know, we have a great set of coaches who work with our students, but they're not all qualified to deal with students as they encounter issues, allows us to kind of get all the expertise in one place. Um, and so we'd work with her to identify uh, the 28 potential students. We work with students uh, who've already been enrolled for one term, who we've gotten a chance to know, who we think could benefit from this. Um, we think there's great need actually at this 18 to 24 age for this type um, of opportunity, uh, often because the students that we work with, despite being 18 and 19, and by many, any sort of like having known an 18 year old, 19 year old children and kids, um, they're largely independent and on their own, you know, and, and working. Um, and, you know, they may be working hard and doing what they can, but really 19 to 20 year old can only really access so much uh, income. And so a lot of our students who are trying to uh, get schoolwork done to give them that opportunity down the road are working low wage jobs, often multiple jobs, uh, which ultimately can keep them from getting that degree. Um, in terms of timing, uh, where we would be able to start really as soon as possible, we enroll students six times a year. So we probably align it with one of our start dates. We have a May and a July and August. Um, so we would really you know, target those students who knew could benefit from it, who've also been enrolled for one term. So we know that they're gonna be sticking with school, that this is for them, that they wanna do it. Um, and then are gonna be with us for a while. Um, I know, you know, the average student graduates relatively quickly for us. Uh, so mm -hmm. a student graduates with an associate's degree in 18 months on average, or three years with a bachelor's degree, um, mainly because they can go to school all year long and they often do to get ahead. Um, and, but that would give us the time frame to also stick with them um, and stay in touch with them, be able to report back to you. You know, our students are in touch with coaches two or three times a week. Um, really the way we view our coaching is personal training for education and everybody, you know, needs someone in their corner pushing them to do stuff that they don't kind of really want to do, like all of us in our own things in our lives. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so, so, and then that would be the way we'd stay in touch with folks. We have a pretty straight, awesome sort of reporting situation with Southern New Hampshire University where we know where students are academically every single day of the year. Uh, so we're able to keep that in touch as well. Um, and then so I know a final question was around uh, sort of the, the administration of it. Um, you know, we, we operate with bill.com already. We imagine that could be how we administer it. But obviously, you know, we kind of see how it all shakes out to make sure we're doing the right thing. Um, and uh, yeah, in terms of additional support, in addition to the, you know, college coaches that we have, um, you know, the Sarah, who's our director of student supports, would also be another layer um, to, to work with students to make sure they can address issues. She often works with folks on more acute issues like housing situations, um, on pipes burst, you know, stuff like that, uh, or, you know, access to mental health services, healthcare in general. Uh, so, so she would obviously work with these students probably already in that situation. Um, and, and go forward. And then in terms of final piece on impact, um, our goal is to increase the likelihood of completion in the, the time to completion. Um, our students are enrolling with us 
they're not enrolling in college to like necessarily go on a journey or find themselves or whatever. They need that college degree to learn and to get the skills they need to get ahead. So, um, you know, we would track these students or other students like them. How are they doing versus the average time to completion and, and that sort of thing and be able to report back to you all. So I'll pause there. I think I got everything out in one big burst. Uh, but I want to know if any folks have any questions or if I missed anything. Uh, I have one question is in terms of the selection, because it won't be enough to offer every student uh, mm -hmm. a payment. You know, what what kind of do you do you have a sense of what sort of metrics for selection you would have that, that feels like that's important for the impact data? Yeah. So, you know, we would quite frankly, do a bit of a subjective selection process, right? So we know all our students. Um, we know the ones who are already in touch with our centralized student supports. Our coaches know our students well. And so we would, um, you know, from that group of folks, select the students. Uh, you know, we know what their sort of current work situation is, right? We wouldn't, the 20-year-old who's already, like, for whatever reason, doing something great, making a lot of money or whatever, you know, we, we target the folks that we know this would really benefit. Um, so it would take a, a bit of a subjective approach in that sense. I'm sorry. I think I, we, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was gonna. I was gonna ask. I'm sorry if I. Uh, is that a follow up? You could ask your. Is that a follow up to what you just asked? Because mine's off topic. Not off topic, oh. but off of what you just asked. <laughs> no, I, we feel free to ask you. But I was just going to say, Mike, we talked a little bit about doing some financial literacy with the students, and I thought maybe you want to mention that. Yeah, so you know, we want to make sure you know our our, our coaching model is about being highly personalized. So you know, we get the right folks on the team to make sure that they're able to connect with folks. Um, and, you know, a piece of that, as we think about, you know, this potential extra income source, making sure, you know, students are leveraging it in, in the best way that works for them. Um, you know, some of our programming that we already have, we have a space that I didn't mention, we have a space in downtown Boston, not too far from your office, we're on Milk Street, above the Milk Street Cafe. It's our student center, we're open nights and weekends. Students who come here can get a meal. Um, people who need help with transportation can get here as well. Um, we help them with that. And so, you know, we, we see this as an additional piece. Um, and then, so I, I guess back to your original question, um, making sure that, you know, we are in touch with students enough to make sure that, that this um, additional extra income would be um, helping them, you know, being able to focus on school versus taking that extra job or having stress that is sort of, you know, insurmountable. Uh, sorry if I missed it earlier in the or a different presentation, but uh, what's the financial consideration? Like, do you have some formula that you determine how much students get? Is it a one-time thing? Is it a, how's that work? I haven't, um, I've heard a lot about your program, but I haven't heard about the money. So, so do, do, do you mean for this program, for the money they're getting for this program, Peter? Yeah, or in the future, like, presumably there's, you know, you figure out some way to how you're going to distribute payments, and I don't know what that is. So uh, each, pro the, the two organizations that are um, selected will get 20, will be able to serve I guess, 20 students. Sorry, I guess, what I, I guess what I meant was, how do they, your organization, determine how students get whatever monies that you're going to distribute? Like how do you select the 28 students or how do they actually like get the cash sent to them? No, I don't mean physically. I mean, how do you, is it the same amount for each student? Does it depend on their circumstances? I haven't heard anything regarding that. You know, that's a good question. Um, I had sort of been working on the model that it was sort of fixed. Thing. Yeah, it's the same amount for each student. And which is? $150 for 18 months. Okay. Oh, Thank for you. 18 months. So it is pretty standardized. I think that's the way we set it up. And it's not a lot of money, but it's still significant. Yeah. Actually, I have one other question. So if this feels like a productive pilot, so to speak, I mean, what do you think you would be able to take forward from that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, one, it's an opportunity for us to go do this in the future, um, and, you know, raise money around it. Um, you know, our partner, Southern New Hampshire University, 
um, just put out a big uh, report around what they found with the emergency grants that came out during COVID for students. And they were actually able to track academic success of students who received some of those grants and didn't. So they already have, you know, quite frankly, some, some infrastructure in, in place to start to share this information that we could help potentially leverage. Um, and I think, you know, it's a, it's a meaningful amount of money, but uh, it's also uh, an achievable amount of money in terms of continuing to raise in the future if we find it's valuable uh, and students find it's valuable. Thank you. Awesome. Any burning questions? Or are we going to let that mic go? All right, Mike, great job. I know we didn't give you much time. You covered a lot of information and we really, really appreciate it. Thanks all. Nice to see everybody. Thanks for talking. Right, thank <laughs> you so much. Bye. Bye. Eddie, how much time do we have? We have three minutes. Right. Well. Does anyone want coffee? Okay. Um, Heidi, I just have a question that maybe you know. Is there coaching uh, mandatory for each student? Like, how do they make sure that? It sounds like they have a great relationship with their students based on the model. They do. I, I don't think it is mandatory because they, he did mention at one point that um, some students are there all the time and really taking advantage of the program and others, you know, aren't as involved. And I think he was, they were thinking of that they would choose the ones that are really are involved. And he did talk about how um, you, if you, if you didn't need to work multiple jobs, you could get your degree, your full bachelor's degree in three years. Yeah, they go incredible. around. It's really impressive. But some of them have to take, and they're very flexible with, that's the part of the structure, but some need to take time off because they're working so many jobs. And that this could, for, for some of those students, it would help them to be able just to, enough to, to, to yeah, eat lunch. Even just have like one job instead of multiple jobs. Mm -hmm. So we have the people for Haven here, if you want to start early, or oh, we have another we have a question Levinia. from Lavinia. Oh, yeah. Lavinia, you have a question? Well, I, I think I just missed it. How many of these people don't have English? That's, that's, that's the idea. first language. Was yeah. that important? I don't know. Um, He did say that 85% of their population was Black and Latina, but he didn't say anything about language issues. So I don't know, but uh, they have a pretty good success rate of, of getting people through the program. So um, yeah. if they are, if English is not their first language, I'm assuming that they have services to help them, them through that. Um, okay. He also said what I thought was very interesting, 33% are parents. Yeah. Young parents. Yeah. But this but this program would target the the 18 to 24 year olds, right? Yes. Yeah. But yeah. even in that group, I'm sure oh, there are fewer yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. parents. I mean looking at the the cost the model of two ads that the per semester yeah. unlimited units, it feels yeah. like yeah. the benefit yeah. of getting yeah. through faster yeah. too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 I told them. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Anything else? We have one more minute. <clears throat> Not to be timely or anything. Right. <laughs> yeah, and you're right. You got to keep yeah. us on. <laughs> all right. I think um, we all good. Ready to move on? Okay. So that, next. Sorry. So that per yeah. student is that per student information that you just said. That uh, is that are the next group? Or is it going to be a different amount? Like how does that? No. So yeah. every everybody in the um, the program offers one hundred and fifty dollars a month per student for 28 right. students for 18 months. And that's for everyone. So two different organizations will be receiving the, okay. that package. Okay. Thank and, you. and if they're receiving that from this effort, are they concurrently going to be fundraising and could they potentially increase that amount per student? They certainly could. A lot of them, I think actually all of them talked about um, after an evaluation and the evaluation that I made clear to them, we're not expecting a real evaluation because right. they don't have a big enough size and they don't have, <laughs> we're giving them 5,000 to administer. So, um, the uh, my train of thought. What were we saying? Well, so potentially, okay, if you have two different they programs, could raise money. you're able to give more money per yes. student. You're going to have two different, right? And yeah. also, all of them talked about using this if it's successful as a way to get it to continue to, to funders, mm -hmm. or one of them has a state funding. Okay, I think we're good. You're ready. ready. You're ready. Haven it's project. Yes. Here comes Haven. For them to leverage. Yeah, but we have one group getting mm -hmm. three hundred, another group only getting one hundred fifty. Yeah. Just... <laughs> Welcome, Tracy and Angelica. Is that right? Yeah. Good morning. Um, thank you Good so morning. much for being here. We're not going to go around with introductions because we want to save all the time for you. Uh, you have 10 minutes that we talked about and seven minutes for presentation and three for questions. And the floor is yours. 
Awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen just because we only have one image. I'm not going to do a, 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 a PowerPoint presentation, but I um, just wanted to show you all. Um, I'm hoping you guys can see that. Yes. Uh, we just wanted to show you a little bit about what um, like our job training program we're going to talk about and um, like what our drop in center looks like as well. So um, as, as well as our mission statement on there. So um, we have prepared the questions that Heidi gave us. So we're going to kind of just go through those quickly just to get to the question session uh, section. We're really excited about uh, kind of engaging with you all rather than just um, kind of relaying information to you. But um, so our organization was founded in 2011. Um, the Haven Project uh, started with the mission to equip and empower homeless youth. Um, since our inception, we've helped over 1,700 young adults on the North Shore of Massachusetts and Essex County, really. Um, our programs currently support 300 youth a year uh, through one-on-one -on -one case management, and we have drop-in hours. We have six service areas that we focus on, so basic uh, needs, housing, employment, education, health, and community. Um, and in 2016, we opened our social enterprise cafe, Land of a Thousand Hills, which is on the first floor of our building. And the second floor is where our uh, drop-in center is. Um, and we use that as a, the cafe as a job, uh, on-site job training program, which is um, the young man that you see there with the, the coffee gear in his hand. Um, our target population is heart, a homeless or imminently homeless young adults ages 17 to 24 who lack permanent and reliable homes uh, or residences and who are currently not engaged or connected uh, with other support services. So um, our clients are not actively parenting. Um, they're not addicted to drugs or alcohol. We get that question a lot. Um, and most of the time we can tell that they just wouldn't be able to engage with us on the level that we um even though our services are voluntary, it's pretty, ad um, usually we can tell that. Um, and they do not have any serious criminal records. Um, we have 61 of our uh, clients who identify as female, 39% as male um, identifying typically, 82% identify as immigrants and 22% of them are actually learning English actively. Um, and we find it will take someone who has no other established supports at least 12 months to walk through the door um, of walking through the door and benefiting from all the services that we provide to attain self-sufficiency. And then when looking at the past three years, we have an average quarterly retention rate of about 62%. So that means about 62% of youth that we have engaged consistently for a period of three months or longer. We're also currently in the process of building two new housing projects in Lynn. Both are fully funded. The first, Catalyst Housing, is a $50 million capital housing project. This will be a permanent supportive housing initiative that we're building on the top two floors of our building at 57 Monroe Street in Lynn. Catalyst will have 24 studio units, on-site case management, and a live-in resident manager. Construction for this project is set to begin later this spring with the hopes of opening the doors in the spring of 2025. The second is a program funded through the Department of Housing and Urban Development called the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program. We were awarded $2.3 million to create a youth specific joint transitional housing and rapid rehousing program. This will provide eight units of transitional housing and 16 rapid rehousing vouchers for a total of 24 enrolled program participants. This project is set to open this spring and will allow for 36 months of funding for each enrolled client. We feel that this provides a cohort timeline that will align well with this project implementation. Between the two initiatives, we will have a total of 48 young people off of the street and on their way to stable housing, all of whom will benefit from utilizing the guaranteed income program as they work on long-term stability. Because this program will only consist of 28 participants, we will also consider the following factors in selection. Internet knowledge and engagement, basic needs milestones, which measures if they have food access and other basic needs met, and general case management engagement. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we use our social enterprise cafe as an on-site job training program. Um, and through a lot of trial and error, we have created um, a low barrier stipend payment system. And we really believe it would be helpful for this type of program implementation. Um, and should we be selected, we would also 
be researching some best practices. I know there are some really great pilot programs for guaranteed income programs across the country. Um, so we'd be looking at organizations nationwide at, um, that are designing programs similar. And um, we would want to have a specific emphasis on limiting any barriers for our clients because that's really um, barriers of opening a bank account and that's what we work on with them, but it can be really um, stifling to have that happen immediately. So um, we would be opening our joint transitional housing and rapid rehousing program this spring, likely in April or May. So we would be able to start this program immediately with program participants. Um, and we believe that this income, so between this income, supportive services and a pathway to stable housing, um, we believe that those are really strong incentives to not only have the cohort um, stay, but actively participate in program and benefit from it. At the moment, we currently have an infrastructure in place that connects each client with case management. Our program participants have the opportunity to meet weekly to work on things like addressing basic needs, obtaining and maintaining housing, achieving educational milestones, and securing employment or being participant of our job training program. We feel that implementing this type of program will create more opportunities for program participants. As an example, we currently hold workshops geared towards understanding taxes and financial literacy during each of our drop-in center hours. We will also especially encourage all participants in this project to attend those workshops to increase their financial stability. We find that this opens up more conversation about things like budgeting or how to set up bank accounts. It also encourages them to access food on site, connect to other peers, and create a sense of community. Um, we believe this funding will lead to reduced homelessness and reduced food insecurity, and we would hope to increase financial stability, goal completion, and financial literacy, and we anticipate longer, more in-depth engagement. Um, we believe that additional income would also greatly assist with transportation, especially to and from employment and school. When we think about how we will evaluate this impact, we think about systems that we currently have in place. Right now, we have a client feedback system for our client services and our job training program. Each is aimed to measure how the income helps them and their quality of life. We will also want to expand upon that to evaluate how this income helped them complete goals, make rent, buy food, or even if it led to less financial anxiety. We currently only have one way for our clients to make money within our programming, which is through our job training program. If selected for this program, this will allow us to provide immediate cash assistance beyond JTP. We have seen on a smaller scale what an impact this funding could have through the payments that we do from our job training program. But we have never had this type of an opportunity to give them a level playing field. We're excited for the prospect of what this could mean for our clients over time. We're so grateful for groups like yours who are pioneering these programs. Um, and we just want to thank you all for your time um, to hear our proposal. And we're really honored to be considered for this opportunity. So we've never had this before. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions? We have like two minutes. That was a great presentation. Thanks. Do we have any questions? Are we good? I think what I say that is that they covered all of You us. did. No, you did a great job. Everything. You both did a great job. So thank you very much. Thank um, you. We tried. We really, we timed it out. We really did this back and forth yesterday. We wanted to do <laughs> <laughs> robotic. We wanted to answer your questions and make sure you knew how important this was. Just to just to let you all know what we were doing too. Um, we're just honored to be even considered. Awesome. All right. Great job. Really. Um, we're good. Thank you so Thank much. You. Really Thank appreciate you so much. it. Thank you. Thanks for the work you do. We appreciate you. Thank you. Good. Okay. Uh, we have another three minutes. If anyone wants to drink coffee or thoughts on 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 them, we'll, we'll have full discussion later. But if you have anything you want to share now, no, it's fun. Very different. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think that's what when when you, we chose the four. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we're looking for, and this is an example, right, right. of the box mm -hmm. of difference. Yeah. Um, that was an excellent presentation. Yeah. Just to echo the. Yeah, the, it really was. We, they listened to what we wanted to know. They reported on it. 
And uh, the fact that there were no questions, I, I think, is testament to that. Mm -hmm. Those two women. With, plus, they were so passionate. Yes. About it. I, you, and yes, you could tell matters. they practiced. Not that Michael was, but I mean, it was just, mm -hmm. um, and the timing is. With the housing uh, is good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, this is so corny, but I do feel this about grant making and philanthropy. It just made me tingle a little bit. Yeah. Just like this could work. It's just yeah. fabulous. Yeah. They're, they're, I mean, even if they weren't under consideration for uh, a guaranteed income or cash payment, uh, Grant, I, I want to follow up. Okay. Yeah. I, I, they're doing great. Yeah, I, they I visited them um, probably four or five years ago through Cummings, and um, so they have this coffee shop, and it's a cool little coffee shop. The the tea stop has moved yeah. since they started, and it's not doing as well anymore because they don't get the same traffic. So they're actually doing um, job training through other places, um, but they're still still doing it, but it's not quite as <laughs> as it used to be. But above that building. They're making 28 units of housing mm. and they are sort of like a dorm room The and there's no time limit. So these youth can stay in the housing for as long as they want. I'm going to talk there. So they can, um, let's try to talk a bit, but anyway, they can stay in the housing for as long as they want. There's no like insecurity that over a certain period of time, I've got to be out, but you don't really want to stay there. You can't have guests and it's small, um, but there's like an RA on the floor and there's a lot of services for them. So they have that sense of security. Really a supportive living environment. Yes, um, that they know that they can have for as long as they want. And then hopefully they will. Sometimes I think I want to move back to a dorm room. <laughs> <laughs> very minimalist. But I think that that is a, you know, that's a really nice balance. You know, yeah. we're going to have a safe place for you. There's a supportive services, but you're not forced out. But there's the way people want to move on in their lives right. it right. gives them every chance yeah. just a quick question um do, do you know if uh they can be undocumented um i know they mentioned a high level of immigrants and english language learning i don't remember if it was that but some of them were saying that there's a difficulty with um cash payments. with cash payments uh, as far as bank accounts if they're undocumented but there are systems out there that you can give money to undocumented right. so there is a way around it i if, think they probably found a way to Resolve around yeah, it, but that's right. a good question. I'm curious if that's part yeah. of the relationship. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it very well could be, but but they they could still participate. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think that's neat. This could be so transformative for them at the organizational level, and mm -hmm. also for the individuals who participate. Uh, and as as everybody else has said, I would echo the fact they did a really nice job trying to make that point. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and and share with us how important this could be for them. So um, they did a great job. Great job. Mm -hmm. One more minute, technically. One minute. Do you know if they do like GED or uh, school degree support as well? Um, I mean, they did mention or education. I know they helped them yeah. to do education. I think they probably do it through their case management program. Um, yeah. Okay. So, but and probably not as strong a college emphasis. Yeah, no, right. I was just thinking yeah. high school. You know, right. Yeah. yeah. Are I said or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I think they, they do offer that. Ready for the Wiley Network? Yeah. The one negative, not negative, but just so you know, when I site visited them, it was four or five years ago. They were talking about building those two units, and they're still a year away. I think yeah. COVID really messed them up, but they, yeah. that, um, that yeah, did take. Housing talk. takes a long time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are housing developers with millions of dollars that can't still get can't get done. the job done. I'm impressed that they've done it, and they have a they have a the date, money, and they have the money, and yeah. they have... And they got this recent new grant from the, the, yeah, the I think huge grant. Really has, so. yeah. And they've only been around since 2011? Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, that's it's long enough, but it's not like it's had a 60-year yeah. history. So, I think fantastic. We may, All right. have, we may not have time for this question, but I, I, it's just I'm sitting with it. I think I heard them say that it takes 12 months mm -hmm. for someone to attain self-sufficiency. I don't, I mean, I can make assumptions as to what self-sufficiency means, but what does that mean? What does that mean? Right. Or what does that look like? Yeah. Does that's someone move out? Does, I mean, like, what? I don't know what. Yeah. How do means. they define that? Yeah. yeah. So that's the one question I'm sort of sitting with. I too agree with everyone that that's a power. It's a powerful um, example. Yeah. Sure. What self sufficiency to you might not be yeah. self sufficient. Right. So right. Right. I right. guess right. they have. I right. guess they show have right? We need to move on. We're going to show right. 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 time for more conversation. Right. Time at the end. So let's go. This is Wiley Network. Wiley, Wiley, Wiley. You never have another computer, so I think it's she's at it. Okay. Recording in progress. Oh.
Uh, Ona, can you just get a setup before you run out? Yeah, I can do that. Just make her big and stuff like that. Hello, Judy. And I don't know the other person's name. Oh, Hard to read here. I was saying three of them. Hi, Judy. Can you hear us? See us? I can see you and hear you. Awesome. Um, awesome. So we are not going to do introductions because we want to save the time for you. We're just going to let you uh, get started. You have 10 minutes, seven minutes presentation, three minutes Q&A, but no pressure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We're ready. I just have one question. Um, I put my slides in the Zoom. Do you want to share them, Heidi, or do you want me to share them? You can share them. Okay, so I can share my screen. Don't start the timer yet. <laughs> okay. Um. Oh, this is Judy, Bonnie, and Ina. It looks like to me. Ina, yes. Yeah. All right. This is going to be a little tricky, but I'm going to try and make it work. You can ignore the slides initially. Um. Hi, everybody. I am Judy Alpern King, and I work for the Wiley Network. And the Wiley Network was founded in 2015 to address the social the inequities on college campuses for college students who are navigating on their own. We did not invent this. Uh, we um, we adapted a model that is largely in California and in Michigan. And we expanded it and changed the model a little bit to be um, more robust and to provide more wraparound services for college students. The college students we work with are navigating on their own. What that means is they may have been homeless. They may have experienced foster care. They could be estranged from their families because of gender identity or sexual orientation. Many have parents who are managing mental health issues, addiction, and um, some incarceration. Now, when we look at college students on campus, the thing that's the most unique about these students is that they are not navigating college with family privilege. And I'll explain that in a minute. Um, they are often students who are the first in their families to go to college, but not always. They are all living below the poverty line. And this is a small subset of those students. And here I've presented the formal definition of what we call family privilege. But what I wanna point out is that we work so hard to be dress, addressing issues around um, inequity and racism and um, homophobia and ableism and all the other um, privileges that people have that they're often discriminated against. And what we often don't talk about is what that means to be navigating those identities without a safety net, without a support team. And so at the Wiley Network, we um, provide services to address the issues of what it might be like to really feel like they are alone on a college campus, surrounded by people who have family privilege. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Ine, our Director of Clinical Coaching, who's going to talk to you about, um, about exactly what we do. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so at the Wiley Network, we have three components to our program um, that we call Scholar Services. So our first component is the Clinical Scholar Coaching. And each student that we meet with, they meet with their coach. Um, many of our coaches uh, were therapists or have a clinical background, um, and they're retrained as a coach to work with our students. So we see the student as the expert in their own lives, and we help them to problem solve with a present and a future focused approach. We don't ask our students to share their stories with us um, or to use their stories as a, as a bargaining chip for these services. Our second component is the financial aid coaching and supplemental financial assistance to our scholars. And our third component is the community piece. Uh, so building a community where students can support each other um, and externally, you know, we introduce students to people who can help them 
build social capital uh, and support their career development. And we fear that that is a major um, piece of the program as well. So I'm going to talk about uh, how this would work and how we would implement this program and when the start date would be. At this time, um, we provide current Wiley scholars with a stipend of $150. So we already have a uh, program in place for that. And it's set up through bill.com, um, which is our platform to allow them to sort of manage the uh, confidential aspects of their banking information and then allow for us to make seamless transfers to them whenever we want to or they need for it. Um, all 2024 and 2025 graduates would receive the funds and we would start the program with 15 students in June, 2024, and um, they would receive their first funds within a month of graduation. The second group would, uh, of approximately 15 also, would begin around June, 2025. And as mentioned, we already have that system in place through bill.com to distribute the funds. So we just maintain it that way. Uh, we have several ways that students um, alumni keep in touch with our uh, with the Wiley program. They're invited to events that we orchestrate throughout the year. We have two community days, uh, one in the spring, one in the fall. And then we also have a career fair. This will be our fourth year this year having the career fair um, in the fall. And then we have a variety of workshops and seminars throughout the year that we offer to students. And we also invite our alumni. Um, for example, we have a, had the past two years, we've had something um, a, a group come in and talk about financial literacy, like a three-part series. And so alumni are able to take advantage of that. We have a career and financial aid coach on our staff, and they're available to support alumni through applying to graduate school or any other questions they may have about either of those topics. And we help them make career connections and introductions. We have a LinkedIn group that we're getting off the ground, and um, there are a lot of peer-to-peer -peer connections that are happening there. We send them birthday and holiday cards, which is a nice little surprise for them to receive at those times of year. And uh, we also provide them with what we call next chapter care packages. Um, it's just a little, little nice uh, boost when they graduate to start them to launch off into their postgraduate life. And they can always reach out to us. Um, in fact, I was mentioning earlier that I have uh, one of the alumni that I work with, I'm having dinner with tonight and her birthday is tomorrow. So, um, they can always reach out to us whenever they need to. I just want to add into that. I know the numbers don't add up. We were talking about 30 students and you got, are all talking about 28 students and we would just provide the, the differential there. Um, so I just didn't mention that. Um, lastly, how would this impact our program? I think having the Students are so vulnerable during that period of time between graduation and starting a first job. Even if you have this great job, you that salary doesn't come all to you in a lump sum. And so this gives them the ability to have some sort of stable money that's coming in. They, it's predictable. They know it's going to come. They they already trust us. You know, when you're waiting to get that first paycheck, you're not quite sure it's going to come. And so you ask a lot of questions about that. So um, we do think it would provide some um, reduction in stress. They could save it if they wanted to, which is, you know, we always encourage them to save. Um, it's also a motivation to stay connected to us. And and I and that would be sort of an added value. In terms of evaluation, we do yearly evaluations for alumni already. And then at five years, we do an interview. And then at five-year intervals, we will go forward with um, surveys. Um, what we would do in this case is we will add a survey at six months and add another survey at 18 months so that we get the intervals during this 18 month period. Um, and then we would, you know, we're always open to ongoing feedback and the, and the students know that they freely tell us what they think mm -hmm. about what we're doing and what works and what doesn't work. Awesome. You did it, thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, we have like two minutes for one minute for questions. Two minutes for questions. Any questions? What about my screen? Yeah, I have a question. Oh. <clears throat> Feel free to speak up on the screen if you have a question. S say that again. Feel free to ask your question. Oh, thank you. I will. Um, I love that you're doing follow-up. I think that's such an important uh piece. Um, you know, both to 
establish and and continue to develop a relationship, but also just to know how things are going. I wonder, do you have any challenges with keeping track of where young people are? Uh, they tend to be a mobile bunch, and um, <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm wondering if uh, if they remain connected to you uh, in a way that allows you to continue with this follow up. I think. You know, I would say the majority, yes. What I think is wonderful about the way things have worked out with Wiley is that each student has this coach and the relationship is what we call transformational. Mm -hmm. And so a, a student just reached out to me um, from three or four years ago um, that I had worked with. And so even if I didn't work here anymore, they would probably reach out to me first because mm -hmm. we had the relationship. And we hope that most staff would talk to them because we have genuine relationships and then they can refer them. So if I wasn't working here, I would refer them back to Wiley. Um, but at each of those touch points that we have along the way, we do a lot of texting and that's where we make the effort to get updated addresses so that we can, we say, we're going to mail you a birthday card with a gift card in it. <laughs> we need your address and so that that helps that's wonderful thank you uh one more question anyone all right thank you so much you, you did a wonderful job we appreciate it we know it's hard to condense it all into 10 minutes and we really appreciate you doing it in your time thank you thank, thank you so much bye-bye <laughs> bye-bye bye -bye. Bye -bye. Good. Okay. So, so this seems really basic, which is why I didn't want to ask it. But uh, do I understand that they engage with students once they're already in college, as opposed to helping them? No, they start get... helping them. They start in the beginning, helping them get into college. Oh, okay. And then they support them through college. Right. Uh, and I think I shared story, originally talking to the board chair, not this person, about guaranteed income and what would they think. This is in the very beginning. We're just and they were like didn't know what the guaranteed income was, but they're giving the students $150 a month yeah. uh, to spend as you want. Like but our program would be post-grad. Yes, but yeah. this program, so it stops when That's they the graduate. That's the clarifying question, right. is that right now, yep. uh, uh, once they graduate, they're no longer in the Wiley network. Right, and so the funds the, go to their the Their site then would stop. Yes. And what they're proposing is to continue. To yes, yes. With, with us. Awesome. Right. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Do you know how many young people they're actively working with? Um, well, I know there's like, I think she said like 15 graduating this year. So times four plus there is, um, and they're growing every year. I think they're taking 10 additional people in every year because the program is growing. I think the organization has grown a lot in the past 10 years. When did they start? Uh, 2015. 2015. So they've had a really good startup and I think they're in a good but it's focused that. cohorts. So yes, so yeah, that's why it's more than 15, yeah. right? Because if it's per year, you yes. have different cohorts. So yeah. in the totality of how many young people they're supporting, yeah. I'd just be curious to see. Yeah. yeah. And they have um, these communities they talked about. It's a, They all come together. Like they can be different years or whatever. And it's yeah. a sense of community that they don't really have. Right. A lot of them are having a hard time. They have a hard time fitting in at college because they don't have those resources. And this is a real sense of community for them because it's people in similar situations. So they speak to their success rate right in graduation. It's really yes. high. Four it's year. high. Really high. I don't know the number, but it's it's crazy it's on high. The website, it's yeah, yeah, it's 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 it's, it's a crazy it's high. Close to a hundred percent, and with foster population, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, um, I love the way they um, showcased family privilege. Mm -hmm. Um because yeah. I think that's just something we don't think about. Okay, well, social network. That's part of what the alumni. Yes, right. Yeah, you know, if somebody who's been out ten years. They actually the, connect them with business people. With, yeah. They make the connection because you know when right. your kids graduate, you use your parents' yeah, connections. Right, yeah. So okay, onward. Great. We, we have uh, summer youth promise for all right. There we go. Awesome. <clears throat> Doing a good time. Mm -hmm. No color. Hello. Oh, hello. We have two of them? Yep. Mm -hmm. There's three of them. Three of them? Mm -hmm. Hang on, we're just getting you all on screen. <laughs> You're the amazing Anna. Awesome.
All right. Well, well um, thank you so much for joining. We are not going to do introductions because we don't want to take up your time. You have 10 minutes, seven minutes to talk, three minutes for Q&A, and uh, no pressure, but we are excited to hear from you. <laughs> so can we just take it from here? Sure. It's all yours. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. Thanks for including us in your process and your desire to learn. Uh, my name is Nicole McLaughlin. I'm the executive director at Plumber Youth Promise. And during our time together, our brief time together today, I'm going to give you a little background about our approach. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Paula Young, our director of growth and innovation, who will give you a little bit more detail. And we'll close it out with Nancy Jones, our director of development and communications. So Plumber Youth Promise, we were founded in 1855, one of the oldest youth serving organizations in the country, probably. Uh, we started as a reform school working just really with local youth. And today we are, uh, we work with youth in Massachusetts, but we also have a national presence. Uh, I've been on the board. I've been involved with Plumber for a very long time. I started on the board in 2002, served until 2009 when <laughs> I joined the staff. And between 2009, 2019, I worked in strategy and development. And then three months before the pandemic, I became the executive director. <laughs> um, I could I could go off on that, but I won't because I know my time is limited. So anyway, we have a lot of different programs. I'm not going to talk about all of the programs, but I want to really emphasize what is core to all of them. And that is our belief that all young people need a family that's committed to them forever. All young people, regardless of their age or their circumstance, need and deserve a family. We didn't always think that way. The reality is in our field, uh, when young people turn around 14 or 15, everybody thinks that we need to not focus on family and we should be focusing on skills uh, and teaching kids to live without family. We actually used to operate that way we found that actually that did not lead to good outcomes. And so we shifted our practice beginning in about in 2011. Um, when we shifted our practice, we also committed to learning from our practice and to trying to figure out is, is this new approach working? We saw some pretty early traction there that, uh, that made us realize we needed to go all in on it. We found that other organizations wanted to learn from us. And so we were able to enter, um, enter sort of a consulting and training arena, working with some organizations that you've probably heard of, the Home for Little Wanderers, Bridges Homeward, which used to be Cambridge Family and Children's Services, the Justice Resource Institute, as well as consulting to different child welfare organizations around the country uh, with the support primarily of the Annie E. Casey Foundation. Uh, all of this, again, focused on getting youth, making sure that youth have family, regardless of their age or circumstance. Now, we also know that when young people turn 18, as a culture, we start to think of them as adults, right? And, um, and our systems start to think of them as adults. And we know they still need the physical support. We may need emotional support. They need practical support. So we have a program that serves young people between the ages of 18 and 22 um, and helps them get into their first apartment. And that's the, that's the program we'll be focusing on with you a little bit today. Um, right now we have 25 young people in, in these apartments. They are scattered sites apartments. Um, their average age is 21. On average, they've been working with us for a little more than two years. 80% of the young people in those apartments as of uh, for FY22 were young people of color. And, and this may shock you and I, I hope it doesn't, but, it, but it's, it's real. Um, they have been away from family for almost 10 years. So uh, they may have bounced in and out of the foster care system. So maybe back with family for periods of time, but since their very first removal, it's been almost 10 years. So that's a very quick snapshot. I'm gonna turn it over quickly to Paula uh, to tell you a little more. Thank you. Um, it's really great to be here. Um, my background is in child welfare and youth development, primarily um, experience in public child welfare systems, as well as um, working at the Annie Casey Foundation and their child welfare strategic consulting and some nonprofits in between. 
So this is an um, exciting opportunity to talk to you guys. Um, as Nicole mentioned, um, I manage our growth and innovation work as well as co-leading our consulting, national consulting team. But um, let me move into what really matters, which is uh, young people that we are serving um, through this uh, community apartments program. I'll just say that we, this program, um, while we really focus on helping them set up their first apartment, sign their lease, pay relevant deposits, purchase furniture, it's a ways back from all of us to maybe remember that time for ourselves, but there were a lot of little things that made a big difference. And we generally had support to do that through family. So the young people in this program meet with their social worker weekly, which you know that what that means these days is lots of texts, lots of calls, um, and really wanting to make sure that that's a smooth transition, that questions are answered and that learning is happening along the way. But first and foremost and center to that, as Nicole mentioned, they all have what we call a permanency goal, which is who is your family? How can we continue to build those bonds and make sure you have people in this world forever? And so that's really the focus. And what's important to note there is that the financial support that we provide, which goes above and beyond what the Department of Children Families provides, gives them the relief when those financials are covered to focus on the meaningful um, work of relationships. And so um, one quick thing I did wanna note is that the information that we're gathering through our youth surveys, we've actually learned that young people have said, you know, we'd love additional financial literacy training. And what would be really great if you could help us save more as we think about our future. So they're already thinking about the importance of money, right? That it's really about long-term um, planning. Um, so we would really manage this program starting on April 1st. Um, most of the young people are with us um, 18 months, but if someone were to leave in that time, we would continue to pay for pay them for that duration um, of the grant. And we would also be seeing them monthly. So that's a nice um, touch point for us to be able to connect with them and see how things are going. Um, so important to note that if a young person leaves us, this type of financial support is particularly critical because that's when the department funds tend to end. Um, we do already have a system in place that transfers funds from um, another party to them. So that structure is nice to have settled already. Um, and as Nicole mentioned, um, we do have an evaluation team that is quite strong and always curious and wants to understand how our work with people is making a difference and what our young people really need. So we would love to explore that further with, with you guys, what that could look like, um, and would really wanna give some thought into what kind of information we would wanna collect um, that could be most useful. And I'll turn it to Nancy. It goes so fast. I'll just leave you with so one, um, one closing thought that we've had. And if we were so fortunate to be selected, we think that we could leverage um, this grant in a number of ways. One, to lobby DCF and the legislature to increase their rates that they pay young people, to pay to support young people. And then we also think we could leverage it for additional philanthropy. And I'll stop talking and we'll take your questions. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I may have missed this, but how do young people find you? How do they make their way to you? They're referred through the Department of Children and Families. So, so they could come from anywhere in the state, basically. Uh, they could, but really it's, I would say, Northeastern Massachusetts. And when we look for apartments, um, what we really do is try to find an apartment in a community where we think they have adult relationships that are primed to be developed if they don't already exist, um, rather than sort of putting them all in Salem or all in Woburn or something like that. It, we really cite apartments um, all over the place. Do you have a sense from uh, kids who've exited the program, like what kind of barriers or needs this stipend might address? I can jump in. Um, I wouldn't even say from kids who exited, I would say look at their Christmas lists, right? Yeah. Look at their holiday lists and they're all over the place. They're from, you know, I need a mop, I need some kitchen supplies, I need toiletries, I'd like a rug in my bedroom. So yeah. um, I, I can you Uber gift cards, marketplace gift cards, 
um, it's all over the place, right? Yeah. And then yeah, I'd like a TV. <laughs> Let's be real. We're talking about 18 to 22 year olds. Nicole, one quick thing I would add to that is gas cards, because a lot of them are getting into the workforce and finishing school. And so being able to get to those things is really important. And gas is a lot, even when it's cheap for us, it's a lot in your budget. Uh, you basically have one, we'll give you one more minute. Nancy, can you share a little bit of your story about um, how they make connections, the lunch lady story that really hit me? And I think it, they'd like to hear that. Oh, Nicole, do you mind telling the story? Because you, I'm telling it's like third hand and Nicole's the one who shared it with me. Um, and it's just, this is really illustrates what Paul was talking about, like permanency and how it's not just always biological mom and dad. Yeah, sure. So um, when when young people come to us, we're, one of our first questions is who's in your life? Who's, you know, who's not? We're trying to sort of dig for any kind of relationships. And sometimes, honestly, kids will say there is nobody or the only thing they'll give us is a list of paid staff from a prior program they were in. Um, so we even ask questions like, you know, who makes you smile? Is there anybody who makes you laugh? And one young person said, you have a lunch lady at school. Like she just, she's just always really friendly. She always makes me smile. So we actually reached out to the lunch lady um, and, you know, over the course of time, sort of warmed that into a mentorship. When he moved out, he was in our group home, moved out into his apartment. She was very clearly his, his connection, right? She was the person he was calling. She was the one who helped move him in. Um, she was so... Uh, family relationships, they come in all shapes and sizes. And it's a question of asking the right questions to find the threads to pull on. Um, so yeah, sometimes it, it takes a lunch lady. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any questions? Are we good? All right. Great job. I know it's a short amount of time. You did a great job and we love, thank you for the work you're doing and thank you very much.